Um, but it's awesome to see people starting to slowly trickle in. Hello there, Corey. It's so lovely to virtually see you and hopefully see you one day again. I'm gonna just give it like another minute or two and then we'll kind of just get going into Prevent HD, what it is. Um, and, you know, I'm excited just for everyone to be here and to learn more about research and observational studies such as Prevent and the importance of participating. So any fun facts that you wanna share before we get started, Jane or Trisha, about yourselves? Like a little preview. I know I'm just throwing you on the spot right now, but. There's really nothing amazing about me. There's plenty of amazing stuff about Jane, just not me. <laughs> All right, Jane, I got, I got a, a question before we get started. How long have you been working in HD? Give or take. Um, it's amazing because I've been working in HD since probably 89 or 90. Yeah. Wow. I'm not going to say it, but I'm going to say it. I was born in 1990, Jane. So <laughs> now I know how long you've been working in That's HD. Right. That's right. I was assigned to the, I think it was 89. I was assigned to the HD clinic at San Diego. That is awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. It, it oh. truly was awesome. Yeah. Well, let's get started. Uh, you know, again, thank you everyone for, for joining. This is being recorded um, just so that if you ever want to come back later on to check it out, if you miss something, feel free to do so. But, you know, for this session, Prevent HD, you know, we have Jane and Trisha who work on this study and we'll be sharing a little bit more about what it entails including kind of the criteria, but also the history behind Prevent HD and kind of the why behind it and the importance of it. But before we do that, I just wanted to quickly introduce myself and, and why I find it very important to participate in research. So for those that don't know me, my name is Seth Rotberg and I am a fellow HD community member and advocate that's been involved for 12 plus years. But about 16 years ago is when my mom was diagnosed with HD. Um, I was about 15 years old and five years later at the age of 20, I decided to go through genetic testing to test positive. I think one of the things that I've learned is how to get more involved in the community, not just through fundraising and advocacy, but by participating in research such as studies like Prevent HD. So 31 now, I'm considered pre-symptomatic, but what I've also have wanted to do and continue to do is to play a role in research and advancing, uh, you know, research in HD and really trying to make a difference. And one of those studies is Prevent. I'm actually participating in it in a few days for my second time. And I'm excited just to share that uh, spinal taps aren't as bad as it sounds. I, I was just as scared when, when I was first doing it. And I learned, you know, it's, it's really helping to make a difference by participating by really just trying to understand how do I play a role to really advance advance research. And so I would say it's, it, you have an amazing, uh, and I could be biased, but I, I think an amazing team over there at Prevent HD who really make sure that they answer all your questions, support you along the way, and also just make you feel as comfortable as possible. And so with that, I'm going to pass it on over to Jane, who will dive deeper into it. But if you do have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat or put it in the Q&A, which you should see below and take it away, Jane. Great. Can you see and hear everything okay? All good to go. Great. Thank you, Seth. And, and thank you, uh, Matt and all of HDO. Uh, for having me today. It's, it's my honor to be here with this with this group. Um, I brought up your header and your, uh, I don't know what you call that, support, educate, empower. I love it. If it is a mission statement or something, but I was reflecting on this when I thought, okay, I have this great opportunity to talk about our research 
with this group and really the essence of what you're here for is support, educate and empower. So then I thought, okay, what does research have to do with it? And uh, it was pretty easy because I right away went, well, yeah, you can, we can do all three of these things while we do research. And that's really why I have found uh, this community, the HD community, such a, a good place to be that I've stayed here for many, many decades and continued my work in this area because it is a good place to be uh, for everyone involved, to get support, to educate one another in the world and to empower one another and the world to make lives different for people with HD. So hopefully I can share these views with you and get your input. So I want to start with just the amazing changes that have occurred in Huntington's disease research since I've been involved, which yes, has been a long time, but we didn't have anyone interested in Huntington's disease in the beginning. We really were all focused on trying to provide care, give each other support, trying to figure out what was the best speech therapy and physical therapy and what could we do to help one another and, and avoid burnout. And uh, I'll go back to this. And now when I look up who's involved in Huntington's disease, all these companies come up. And this is even an old slide I haven't updated for a while. So there's so many pharmaceutical, biotechnology, uh, industry, academic places that are taking an interest in Huntington's disease and trying to make a difference for persons with Huntington's disease. And so this is just, a, like I said, a list of all the companies that are really focusing on Huntington's disease today. So I thought we should do just a really two seconds on how do you take all these uh, companies' interests in Huntington's disease and move them towards making a difference for people's lives. There's a lot of bad uh, press on research that it never does anything to help the real person. It always stays in the lab. And I just wanna show you how it works that the studies in the lab are important. The studies in animal models, mouse models, we even have sheep models and pig models of Huntington's disease. It's so excited we've grown and we can look at them all. And then within humans, we have these four phases. Actually, there's more, but the first phase is just to see something more about the, the intervention, the drug that someone came up with. The second one is to make sure it's safe. The number one thing for researchers is just like everything else, do no harm. We're here to make a difference, to make things better and to not do anything that could be harmful. So the very first thing we have to do is make sure it's safe. The second thing then is, make, does it make a difference? Does it help? And this is where is the big challenge comes in. How do we determine if a new treatment is helping some with Huntington's disease? And then if we get through this piece, we go to a very large study. And this is a study we have been able to do in many different treatments and compounds for Huntington's disease. This is when we need hundreds of people and we pay more attention to the dosage and to the side effects and what are willing to, people willing to tolerate. And that's what I just want you to think about today because I need you as partners to work with us in finding better treatments for Huntington's disease. So this is a snapshot of last year's pipeline, drug pipeline. So this is just one year and it shows just companies that are interested in Huntington's disease. And then it shows that they're in the preclinical, the development phase one, two, three stages, or if anything's been, been approved. And the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Association for the United States, has approved two treatments for the motor signs of Huntington's disease. We don't have any other treatments for the symptoms, and we don't have any disease modifying treatments, which is really what really been compelling our uh, research family for years is trying to find out how we could slow the progression of this disease. Or in my mind, I've really been emphasizing how to prevent the onset or slow uh, its impact on someone's uh, lifestyle. So the other thing I wanted to point out in this slide is Interventions can be anything. They can be everything from taking a pill, which we're most used to. If we get a cold or flu, we might get some Tamiflu. But also in Huntington's, we're wide open to considering everything. We will consider things that are intravenous might go in through your vein. We'll consider things that go in through your an intrathecal infusion, which goes in through your spinal column. 
And we'll even consider things that are neurosurgery that go into directly into the brain and provide surgery. And we aren't going to stop at any limitation. Of course, the long-term goal is to get it to be something simple, which is to take a, an oral pill so that um, it can help your lives be as good as possible when we're living in families with Huntington's disease. Now, the focus of drug development for Huntington's has long been on how to treat persons with a diagnosis of Huntington's disease. My emphasis, probably because I'm a psychologist and not a medical physician, I specialize in the other parts of Huntington's that aren't necessarily the movement disorder, the thinking skills, the uh, decision making, the mood regulation, uh, emotions, anxiety. And so my preference is I see people much earlier before they have the movement disorder. And my goal has always been let's try to keep people as early in the disease as possible. So instead of get well soon, I really hope we can move towards stay healthier longer. And that's why we need to talk about it in our families, in our communities, and with each other today and every day to figure out what we can do to move this more rapidly into a situation where we have some choices of when to allow the disease to progress and how we might be able to delay its onset or slow its progression. So my question today is, why would we care about research for HGO? Uh, it is HD youth after all, and can we just wait maybe and, and not have to be involved in something boring like research? And so I'm here to say why it would be important for all of us to join together in partnership uh, first of all, in my research, the best ideas have always come from the family members. Every research study I've done has been in partnership and mostly because someone in a family has kicked me in the butt and said, why aren't you looking at this? And I go, oh, because I didn't think of that. So I, we really need to work together as a team. So here's our, some of the reasons that I really believe we need to keep our focus on continuing to find the, the ultimate cure for Huntington's disease, the treatments that slow it down, the disease modifi modification trials, as well as symptomatic treatments that can just help someone feel better or function better. But in the meantime, we need to think of the big picture is eventually we want to eradicate this disease. And that means moving towards a prevention of Huntington's disease. So one reason we do it is just everyone knows that the best chance of success in any disease is having the healthiest body that goes into that fight. So we want the earliest, healthiest brain and body to better fight the disease. So many people think that part of the reason we can't find a treatment is we are looking pretty late in this disease and maybe we can look earlier. Secondly, we want everybody not just persons with the HD gene, but all of us to be living our best life. We all have something we're at risk for and we have, and we experience stress and distress on a regular basis. It's part of our human condition, but whatever we can do to help one another live the best life we can given what we've been given it is what we need to do. And if we can prevent it and move it back, then you can spend more time at your peak functioning level when you can still uh, experience your physical activity, you can still work full time, you can take care of your kids, you can still do your vacations, live your best life for every year. Of course, our goal is to reduce any suffering and any burden we have on one another, so that as much as we love caring for our families, with, whether they're sick or well, um, we want to maximize our good times together. And that's part of why we want to focus on being ready to move our treatments and trials into a prevention of disease. And the reason I came today to HDO is we really need all ages and specifically the youth. You are the generation, the future generation, the next group that's gonna take over what we do in our world. And that will include hopefully preventing Huntington's disease. So I'm really hoping you can all become part of the partnership to design how we're going to do this because the possibilities are endless and we really want your input. Uh, so make your voice heard and become part of the team. 
okay, so what do we have to do to get towards a prevention of Huntington's disease? Most clinical trials right now are taking people that are diagnosed and figuring out if we can slow the disease itself. There's also many clinical trials that are looked at, can we improve the symptoms, whether they're the thinking symptoms, the cognitive symptoms, the motor symptoms, or the emotional dysregulation symptoms. We're gonna to continue to take care of each other forever. So we'll always pay attention to the symptoms and how we can control them. But in addition, we need to get ready that if one of these treatments slows this disease down, our best chance is to slow it down when you still have as much of your capacity as possible. So these are the gaps. Of, and it really has a who, what, when, where, why, and there's even two what's. I could have done doubles on everything, but I tried not to. So the, the, we need to answer these questions and it shouldn't be just one person answering them. It shouldn't be just a group at uh, the National Institute of Health or some institution answering them. It needs to be all of us because everyone's view matters. So the first one is who, who should be given an intervention to prevent HD? When should we prevent it? There are many opinions on this. Some people think we should design something that can go into babies as soon as they're born, like uh, so that we know immediately what to do to modify the future risk of persons with genetic disorders. Others think that you know the developing brain is different than the mature adult brain, and we should wait till people are at least of adult age, which might mean 18 in some countries. But other people think, well, we should wait till the brain finishes maturing, which frankly for women isn't until like age 26 and for men, of course, later at age 30. That's when the brain completely myelinates. So some people think we probably shouldn't go in until at these later stages and then try to prevent the onset of disease. But I think the prevention of disease is gonna matter from that slide I showed before, whether it's just a pill we take or whether we need to do brain surgery or get an infusion or you know how many hours of prevention activity do we need to do every day. So the second question we ask is what side effects are you willing to experience and when? If you're 18 and you're not going to have the manifestation of your movement disorder until you're 60, we don't necessarily want to start with a brain surgery or even a, week, a monthly infusion. So we need to think about what side effects and when in your life and who better to do this but you, because you are the generation that it's going to impact. If any of these treatments, that big list I just showed you, looks like they're going to move and last year we really thought we had a couple that looked really good, then the next thing we want to do is move them earlier. So last year it looked like we were going to have two or maybe three treatments to move into a pre-symptomatic sample. Now we're kind of back thinking, okay, let's, let's figure out which one happens first, but we're going to slow the disease down and we need to decide how are we going to apply this to a healthy population. So think about who should be given an intervention, what side effects are you willing, maybe you want to do the brain surgery five years before you have the motor manifestation, maybe you want to do infusions five, ten years before. Maybe you want to take a pill if it's 20 years before. So that's what we want to work on as a team. Then the big question everyone is focusing on, and you can find articles about this for, I would say, two decades now, is how do you prevent brain disease? First of all, how do you prevent anything from occurring and then know that you successfully did it? This is true for every field in medicine right now that's trying to prevent something. We simply don't know how to prove that we stopped something from happening that was going to happen in the future. So with the way people thought we had to do this is we had to take a group, a large group of people that had the risk, the Huntington's disease gene, and follow them over time and give one of group of these an intervention to stall the disease and the other one just let them do what they naturally do. And then in this group, as we know, if you don't do anything in Huntington's disease, people get sick. From, from age two to age 82, they can have the onset of this disease with an average age of age 39. But the other group would then show that their onsets were delayed. If they were the same education and genetics as the other person, uh, their brother or sister who didn't get the treatment, maybe their brother or sister would have gotten sick at age 30 and they don't get sick until they're 40. 
So this is how we'd find a leg. And this is a very uh, challenging design to do. Do we have to wait to see who gets sick or can we find other ways to figure out that we're preventing disease? That's what we're working on. And all the great measures so far have come from family members. You guys have told me, this is what you should look at early and we're doing that. So that's what Prevent is doing. We're gonna find better measures that can show a prevention of disease without waiting for, for 10 years to see who gets sick. Secondly, or fourth, is where will these clinical trials take place? And the more prepared we are, the more likely that drug company is going to say, you know what, you already have these people collected that are measured, we know what their brains look like, we know what their behavior looks like, they're willing to do research, let's start there. So we want to make this a worldwide endeavor where everyone has the opportunity to step up and be included and involved. Then the number five is when, when do we do this? Which interventions should go when you're 18, which one when you're a baby, which when you're 30 and myelinated, and which maybe not until you get a diagnosis of Huntington's disease. And the only way to make that decision is with you. The doctor can't make that decision for you. You need to make it yourself. So we really welcome you to join us and figure out the answers to all of these questions. Because when we do slow the progression of this disease, we immediately tend to move it back to a healthier time. So I hope that this is start to help you think about why you should all be partners in our efforts to prevent Huntington's disease. This is information about our study, what we're doing, and I am gonna let Tricia talk more about it. We um, are recruiting volunteers that are willing to take a risk, take the plunge, be, be pioneers, if you will, be brave and do a lumbar puncture, a brain scan, Assessments that now we're figuring out we need to do them more frequently, maybe even at home, surveys, questions, videos, and blood samples so we can look at all the fluids in your body, all the tissue in your brain, and all your performances to see how we can answer those questions of who, what, what, when, where, and today we're going to answer why. I will stop there and let you think about what is your why, and then I'll turn it back over do I turn it back over to Seth? Well, I can I'm, take it. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on what exactly um, it looks like in terms of enrollment for specifically for the prevent HD study. Um, we are currently enrolling uh, participants, um, as Jane suggested, um, folks who are what we consider pre manifest. Um, we're looking for um, females and especially males, because uh, I think most of us can appreciate that it's a little harder to get those guys uh, to do stuff uh, in the research setting than it is us women. So um, if you're a male, but also if you're a female, we're looking for folks who are early um, in their disease process, um, someone 40-ish plus or minus a few years um, that has been tested um, for the genetic mutation. As Jane mentioned, we ask you to do a lot. Um, and so I just wanna drive home that our lab views our participants as partners. We can't do anything that we do without our partners or our research participants. Um, we believe that this is really a bi-directional uh, benefit. Um, and we want to make sure that everything that you're giving us, we can somehow give you back in return. Um, and so we are very honored to um, talk in places such as HDO so that you guys can understand um, how important it is for us to not only educate you, but give you help and empower you to make choices and promote change because the young folks um, of today are really the ones that can do that. Um, and so it's so important for us to be sure that that message is clear that you are our partner and not just our participant. Thus, we ask you to do a lot of stuff. <laughs> so we have a, this is really a two day visit. The first day we have you Usually we have you come in the night before so we can get started right away in the morning of day one. Um, <clears throat> our wonderful research uh, coordinators, Nate and Alicia, will meet you um, at the front door. 
we have you stay in a very nice Best Western right close to the hospital so you don't have far to travel on your days that you are with us. Um, we usually start out with the obviously the consent. <laughs> um, we collect some demographic information. Um, we go through some self-administered surveys um, and then we get into the cognitive testing. We do provide you with lunch because we want you to stay exceptionally hydrated um, and also make sure that you're not hangry <laughs> during any of your uh, assessments that we're giving you. Um, and then sometimes during, at some time during that day, um, and we are kind of at the mercy of different schedules uh, to get the blood draw in and the MRI scan in, but we plug those in um, at some point during your day one visit. Then at the end of day one, we send you back to the hotel to relax. We ask you to continue pushing fluids because that is so important um, for the lumbar puncture the next day. Um, then typically we bring you back pretty early because you have to be fasting uh, that next day. And we don't want you to have to go without food for too long. <laughs> so we try to get you scheduled for your lumbar puncture as early as you can. Again, we shuttle you back to the uh, hospital, Nate or Alicia meet you at the front door. We escort you up to the clinical research unit at the hospital. That's where we perform the lumbar puncture. We have an exceptional nurse practitioner who completes the lumbar puncture with assistance from trained uh, registered nurses in the clinical research unit. So it's a very safe environment. Um, we, they thoroughly explain things, answer any questions that you might have. And then the procedure is um, carried out. And then we have you lay flat for about 60 minutes and be still, continue to push fluids, continue to have some caffeine because all of those things really contribute to having, um, to lessen any post puncture um, side effects. Uh, the most common side effects is a headache. Um, but if we do a great, a good job of pushing the fluids and encouraging caffeine, um, the headache even becomes even less likely. Um, they will also do uh, another blood draw in the um, clinical research unit. And that's the uh, um, for the uh, research purposes is to collect that blood. Um, the only other thing that I want to add is I know spinal taps are scary, um, no doubt. And we, the reason that it's so important for us to get these spinal taps though, is that the cerebral spinal fluid um, has direct connection to the brain. And obviously Huntington's is a brain disease. So the cerebral spinal fluid really gives us a much cleaner and more precise uh, analysis of what actually is happening. Um, blood obviously travels throughout the whole body and works with multiple different processes aside from just the brain. So sometimes it's harder to see what exactly is in the blood as opposed to the cerebral spinal fluid. So that's why it's so important for us to get the spinal fluid because it lends such a better sample. Uh, the last thing that I'll mention is <clears throat> even if, uh, for whatever reason you don't qualify for this particular study, we do have a uh, Huntington's disease registry started at UW as well. And I will throw that link in the chat. So what that just basically is, is a consent form um, saying that you'd be interested to hear more about. It doesn't lock you into any particular type of study, but just lets us know that you're interested in participating in any research that may come up. And we, we will keep you, um, on the heads up with all the different opportunities that we have in terms of participating in research. Okay, awesome. I think that's my wind. <laughs> awesome, thank you both very much just explaining prevent. And what I will say is, and I, I'll just kind of reiterate what they both said was like prevent HD, you know, observational study. So just so you know, like it's not, there's no treatment involved, but it's really to help study you know, HD community members and be a collaborative uh, participant so that we can really advance research. And if you're like, well, what is prevent? You may have heard of predict HD. It's the same thing, correct me if I'm wrong, Jane, but same thing, uh, just change the name. But essentially, again, the same goal of just really trying to get more people involved in, in research and, you know, don't hesitate to, to reach out if you do have any questions. I know BJ, just posted how he's been a participant in PREDICT, currently participate actually this past November. I participated. Uh, it's just a great opportunity to 
really help uh, you know make a change in in the research space. Um, I do know we're at time, but if you do have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, I do have just one quick question for Trisha and Jane. And so how, what would you say is like a specific demographic that you're looking for as of right now, beyond kind of young, young person, right? Because everyone has their own definition of, of a young, young person. I think the tricky thing right now is being genetically tested is such a personal decision and we completely support you and we are in every way uh, working with everyone, whether or not you want to know your genetic results. And so our lab is moving toward a situation where you could still participate and not be told the results of your genetic test. That is what we're doing in other diseases. And in fact, our lab is doing that with other genetic diseases where you can come in, participate in research, but not necessarily get the feedback if you're somebody that doesn't really wanna have that information. We are moving towards that uh, in the future, but right now we only, really need to focus on people who have already had the genetic test so that we know you either have a gene for Huntington's in your future or you don't have the gene. We take both negative and positive because of course we have to compare how the brain looks and how the cerebral spinal fluid looks and how the blood looks and how you are performing in milliseconds on those iPads. We are measuring it at a rate we can't appreciate it consciously but hopefully we'll detect it before you would even notice it or anybody else would notice it. So that's what we're going for. So we really need people that have already gone through testing. We're moving towards an anonymous testing in the future, but we're not there yet. So I just wanna really respect and know that we're here for everyone, whether or not you wanna be tested. We still want your input on the research study, but right now we do have to only enroll people that have already been through testing. I hope that clarifies that piece that I think is really important. Yes, yes, appreciate it a lot. Um, and if you guys, if anyone here has questions, feel free to, you know, visit the prevent booth. Uh, you know, you can ask questions there, you can learn more. And so with that being said, thank you again, uh, Jane and Trisha. I'm excited to see you all in a few days as well. And you know, I would say next here on, on track two, we do have Sage Therapeutics, who's going to kind of give us a research update, or you can head over to track one, where we have two brothers from Egypt who will be sharing their HD journey. So with that, Jane and Trisha, you are all good to go. You guys can sign off for the day. Uh, thank you again, though. No, thank you for allowing us to be present in, in your powerful meeting. I wish you guys the best and do get in touch. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.